So today we're going to be focusing on CT head for the resuscitationist and what your approach should be every time. And with radiology, I like to say systematic approach every single time, just like reading an ECG or anything else, because you don't want to miss anything, right? So I always start out with a patient scenario and this patient uh, not doing so great. A uh, 37 year old male presents unresponsive after an MVC, physical exam GCS3 was intubated in the field. These are his vital signs. I hope you're thinking about something bad going on in this person, right? Something in mind, maybe like some sort of triad. I don't know. So I'm going to go through the approach to the CT head and how I approach the CT head. And it's a simple approach. We're going to do a quick general overview. So when you're on your axial cut, which is this way through the patient, right? You're on your axial cut. You're going to do a quick scan through and you're going to see if you see anything obvious really quick, right? That's your first step. Second step, you're looking for bleed. And what a bleed looks like on a CAT scan is a hyperdense uh, lesion, typically whiter or brighter than the rest of the brain parenchyma, okay? Next, you're going to be looking for evidence of mass or mass effect. And mass could be, you know, some sort of tumor. Um, it could be some sort of uh, infectious etiology. And then mass effect is what that mass or bleed is doing to the rest of the brain. We're also going to be looking, last but not least, certainly not least, soft tissue and bone. And it's really important to not forget that because some of these bleeds, you'll find out, are associated with certain types of fractures. So when we look at an axial cut of the CT, what we see here is the top, at the top of the screen is the patient's front of the face. The right of the, or the left of the screen is the patient's right side. The left of the screen, or the right of the screen is the left side. Okay, so this is all anatomical, right? So when we look at an axial scan, we're looking at a patient's feet all the way to their head. That's how you imagine going through this scan. So what I like to do is the quadrant approach. When I'm going through my CTs, I break the brain into quadrants and I scan back and forth through these quadrants and then compare them to both sides to see if they are similar, if there's any differences, if there's any evidence of mass, mass effect, effacement, which we'll get into. So let's go through a normal CT head here. So this CT head, we've highlighted in a blue area where you're gonna focus in your quadrant approach. And we're starting at this cut. Does anyone know where I'm at right now? Shout it out if you know it. And it's really important to start in this area. So this is the foramen magnum, right? So this is where our brain stem sits. And we like to focus on this area right away because if there's a patient with a GCS of three, you wanna make sure they're not herniating into their foramen, right? So right now, we see this blue, we're gonna go up, right? So we're starting our approach, we're in our quadrant method, we're now in the left lower quadrant. And we're gonna go really quick through, I didn't see anything obvious on this, and we're gonna go back down, okay. That's our first go through. Then we're just going to keep repeating that in that quadrant method. Obviously, I'm not going to go through each quadrant uh, in this PowerPoint, in this 15-minute talk. But there are a few things anatomically I want you to focus on on this scan. And this cut in particular is really important. Right in the middle here, we have something called the septum pellucidum. And this is really important to know when you're looking for midline shift in a patient. And midline shift lets our neurosurgery colleagues know how bad mass effect is in this patient. I also want you to look at these two black areas that's known as hypodense because it's black. It's, it's closer to the color of water, Hound's field unit of zero. CSF is in those ventricles. Those are the lateral ventricles. And on the sides, we see the sulci and gyri, which are normal appearing, right? And those are the invaginations of the brain. And again, CSF in those areas. And as we go a little bit higher, that white stripe in the middle, that more hyperdense region, is the Falx cerebri. And the Falx is really important when figuring out where your midline is to actually measure this midline shift. So that's our quick run through of the normal CT. So now we're going to go through bleed, a lot of different bleeds here. 
So when we're looking at a bleed or when we see or recognize a bleed, we're going to see a hyperdense region. And again, that's a brighter area on this CAT scan. Sometimes you can have calcifications, which are normal in the brain, uh, but these bleeds we're going to focus on today are quite obvious. You're going to be scanning the edges of the skull and where the area in between the brain and the skull meet. You're going to be going in multiple planes. You're going to start in your axial. You're also going to be going through your coronal, which is crown, right? Coronal going down like this. So you're going back, looking at that way, and then your sagittal going this way, okay? So you're looking in multiple planes and you're checking your ventricles, cisterns, and sulci. And that's so important because we're going to go to our first bleed here. This is an intraventricular hemorrhage. And we already talked about this a little bit earlier today and why it's so dangerous. When you have an intraventricular hemorrhage, you're causing all sorts of problems. And one of the biggest complications of this is non-communicating hydrocephalus. This leads to brain herniation. Uh, and death. So the ventricles are connected to the, um, the subarachnoid space. So sometimes you can have a subarachnoid that turns into an intraventricular hemorrhage. Sometimes you can have an intraventricular hemorrhage that goes to the subarachnoid space, um, and they're all communicating. And the brighter your bleed is, the more clotted that blood is, right? So when we think about an active bleed versus a uh, subacute bleed or a hematoma, there are subtle differences that we'll touch on a little bit later. What is this? Anybody know what the sign is called? Starfish, right? So starfish sign. This is a really classic case of a subarachnoid hemorrhage, which again, it's going to be uh, either communicating into the ventricular system because it is communicating or it's going to start as some sort of aneurysmal rupture or from trauma. Next is subdural hematoma. And subdurals happen when there is some sort of insult to the bridging veins underneath the dura mater, right? So as we age, that gap between the dura and the brain continues to expand. So older folks who fall, hit their head, a lot of them get subdurals. And there's a lot going on in this this cut right here, right? This is a bad, this is a bad CT, right? So here's our subdural. But what else is going on in this CT? Midline shift, right? But what I want you to focus on here is this number, 10 millimeters. And this number is really important because according to the Brain Trauma Foundation, this is the number where neurosurgical intervention is needed. Also midline shift greater than five millimeters which we'll get to. Side point on subdural hematoma. This is a parafalcine subdural hematoma. It's isolated. It's literally just in this area. You can have that. So make sure you're looking at all of your different dura matter when you're looking for your subdurals. This is an epidural. And an epidural is going to be above the dura matter, right? So it's going to stay confined to the skull sutures. It's not going to pass that, but it can go past the brain midline. And in this, you see significant shift. 15 millimeters or 30 cc's, that is neurosurgical intervention, like, immediately. We need that. If radiology says this is 15 millimeters, or you're able to measure that, you need to be calling your neurosurgeon stat. And a quick note on active versus hematoma, right? Which one of which part of this bleed do you think is active? Do you think it's the bright or the dark? Dark, right? So this is a blood clot. And the reason why blood clot is hyper dense on a CT is because it's filled with all this proteinaceous material that lights up bright. And when we have fresh blood going in, that's an acute bleed in that hematoma. And that's very dangerous. When you see something like that, you have to assume there's an active bleed. You should be getting on the phone with your neurosurgeon. And here's a quick uh, example of intraparenchymal, which can happen from AVMs. Again, trauma as well, hypertensive bleeds, uh, really bad stuff. What do you guys see in this scan right here? Any bleeds? Any ideas? So you see calcifications, right? And why do we think it's calcification? 
Yeah, symmetric, right? And it's in a very common area where you do get calcification. If you saw it on one side and not the other, would you be more concerned? Yeah. What about the rest of the brain? Do you see anything else? So this is a patient that came in, tubed, uh, bad MVC. And this is actually consistent with diffuse axonal injury. Um, and diffuse axonal injury causes cerebral edema, right? So when you have cerebral edema, you have effacement. So these sulci and gyri tend to become obliterated. Everything kind of gets blurred on that side of the skull. So that is evidence of cerebral edema uh, and mass effect. Just a really quick word on the big guidelines. I don't know if any, any of you have heard of these. A lot of trauma centers are using this now. Um, my center at Maimonides in Brooklyn, we, we use the big guidelines, which basically says what we can and cannot consult neurosurgery for. This is, uh, it's, it's helping the neurosurgeons out a lot, but we're also finding really good evidence that a lot of these patients do really, really well with, even without repeat CT scans, which is kind of nuts to me uh, when I first learned this. Um, but this is more about consulting neurosurgery or hospitalizing these people, repeat imaging versus the Brain Trauma Foundation, which is like, this person needs neurosurgery intervention like now. Next, we're going to talk about mass effect real quick. And the three things I want you to focus on are midline shift, which we talked a little bit about, herniation, and last but not least, signs of effacement, which again is that fullness, right? Midline shift. We find our falx cerebri, we go down to where our lateral ventricles are to find that septum pellucidum right in the middle. And right away, you can see, first of all, there is an active bleed in that hematoma, right? You see that. But let's find our midline. We're going to measure over to the septum pellucidum, and that's going to be about five millimeters. And five millimeters or greater is when neurosurgery is intervening, right? As soon as you see five millimeters or more, they should be, um, you know, doing a bedside, uh, bedside burr hole or so, something. I'm not doing the burr hole for sure. Um, and then here's evidence of herniation. This is subfalcine. So this is no bueno. This is really bad mass effect. Again, look at the effacement on both sides. You can't see any sulci or gyri, just horrible. And this is why I like to start at the foramen magnum. If you have a patient with a GCS of three, like who came in in the beginning of this lecture, and you see the scan on, my, on your right, that right there is complete fullness and effacement of the form of magnum, which means their, tonsillar, uh, their tonsils of the, of the brain stem are herniating. So they're having tonsillar herniation. And that leads to that Cushing's triad, right? We have the Kelly-Monroe doctrine. We have the cerebral perfusion pressure equals IC, or MAP minus ICP, right? So we have that elevation in MAP right? Just to, just to match that elevation in ICP, just to keep the brain perfused. And when those tonsils herniate, we start to get the weird breathing patterns seen uh, in this Cushing's triad and that vagal response of bradycardia, right? Last but not least, soft tissue and bones. So when we're looking for skull fractures, we're going to switch to a bone window. And in CT, we have a lot of different windows that we can look at. The lung window is great for looking for free air in different places like the abdomen and the head specifically. But here we see a pretty obvious fracture uh, through the base of the skull or the, sorry, the temporal bone of the skull. And a really subtle finding that you may see in a trauma patient where, you know, you're not on your bone window right now, but... In this patient, you see on the right here, all of that kind of darker, all of the uh, more hyperdense material in the, where the mastoid air cells are, that is um, a little bit more specific for some sort of skull fracture. So it can help you find more of an occult fracture that way by looking for those hypodense areas. Most common cause of an uh, an epidural hematoma is laceration of the middle meningeal artery, which can happen from skull fractures. 
And that's exactly what this case was. And here's a bone reconstruction of it right along the side here at the top, uh, from top to bottom. This person obviously intubated, uh, no bueno. So in review, know your anatomy, stick to an approach every single time. It doesn't have to be my approach, but make sure you have a systematic approach. Scan in your quadrants, compare them on both sides. We're looking for bleeds, mass effect, bones and soft tissues in a quick trauma survey. Multiple planes, axial, coronal, sagittal. Remember, acute bleeds are bright. The hematoma is bright, but the active bleed in the hematoma is going to be dark. Subdural hematoma thickness greater than 10. Epidural hematoma thickness greater than 15. Midline shift greater than 5 equals neurosurgical intervention now. Mass effect, check for midline shift. Herniation, signs of effacement or full, fullness in those areas. And then bones and soft tissues, switching to the bone window, checking 3D recon. These are my references. And that is my presentation. Thank you, guys. Thank you.